Good morning. <laughs> Let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, dear friend and guide Swami Kriyananda, we are deeply grateful for the very, very, very good karma that has brought us to this path of self-realization. Give us the courage, the dedication, the energy, the enthusiasm that we may follow this path with joy to its inevitable final conclusion of eternal joy eternal awareness, eternal bliss in our oneness with God. Om. Peace. Amen. Monday is Money Monday, as we've lovingly called it, which is the day that I remind you that this ministry, which we've called Mission of the Masters, is made possible by your generous donations. And your donations have been generous, and we've been able to keep um, book publishing going, creating some audio books from Swami's books, and a couple of translations of Lightbearer, Italian and Spanish. You can go to the Patreon website, and that's a way you can sign up. PayPal now has Mission of the Masters as a registered charity, so if you prefer to work through that, you can. I actually, um, no, I have, yes, I also have Zelle. Zelle is set up in my own name, but it goes into an account that's just the Mission of the Masters. And all of it is now tax deductible because Mission of the Masters is a, an official tax-exempt organization. Patreon is not. Patreon is not tax deductible, but PayPal and other ways that you don donate are. So that's that story. Um, last uh, session, I finished uh, the, the Festival of Light, which took us some does a couple of dozen events to go through, which was really delightful. So I woke up this morning and was reminded that I needed to find something new. So I'm going to follow something that I wanted to do for a really long time. I'm going to hold up this book, which none of you will recognize, because it's a very, very early version of what has now become Affirmations for Self-Healing, I think is what it's called. And for those of you who are familiar with the Ananda Sunday Satsangs, we use, an, every week we have an affirmation for a different quality listed in this book. So there are 53 qualities in this book. But this is not going to really be about affirmations, even though I'll probably mention them. At the beginning of each of these 53, oh, actually it's only 52, um, 52 subjects, um, Swami writes a couple of paragraphs about the nature of the quality of the week. And the qualities of the week, we start with success, it's humility, courage, non-attachment, good humor, even-mindedness. So after some thought, we've decided to call this series Roadmap for Right Living. Because if we can understand um, the nature of each of these 52 qualities and appreciate um, how the, those principles can inform our lives, then we will have exactly what we're promising, a roadmap for right living. So, here we go. The first quality that Swami speaks about is success. And you would think, well, you would, you would put success at the end, because how can you start with success when the whole point of the whole book is to give us, um, uh, how, uh, give us the tools that we need in order to find success? But of course, in Swami's inimitable way, and this is why almost all of the courses that I do start with some writing of his. He has such an extraordinary um, capacity in just a few words to just say exactly what we need. And if we listen and understand what he says, everything else in, falls into line. That's you know, where the idea of this being a roadmap comes from. In, in my experience with him, which I... I knew him closely for 45 years, and 
well, it must have been more or less than that. The numbers are a little confused, but no, because my book has 45 chapters, and I think that's it. But um, it, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to match is the number of years I've been on the path versus <laughs> when he died. But the fact is, 50 is a rounded number, and 45 is a rounded number. Um, I, I try to be so truthful that if I feel like there's any little aberration in what I said, I have a very hard time just sailing past it. I have to stop. One of these is about truth and the importance of just always saying exactly what you mean, being completely sincere and being absolutely accurate. In any case, now, but what Swami does, and you'll see in a moment when I read this, Swami defines, starts by defining what is success. Because a lot of times when we can't answer a question, it's because it's the wrong question. So people set out for success without a clear concept in their mind, even of what they're trying to achieve. They'll think about the forms of success instead of the essence of what success really is. So Swami starts, and when we do this in our Sunday mornings, this is the first Sunday in January. So we're starting a new year, and here we are. And the first thing Swami wants us to understand is, where are we going and why? So he says, true success means transcendence. Uh, I can see that, I hope I can do one of these per day, but I can see how I could spend the rest of the morning on the first sentence. You know, as a writer myself, who actually was, was trained by Swami to write, um, he, he just his extraordinary economy of words in expressing himself. He, he actually describes his work as seminal. And what that means is that, the, that from what he has done, you can go out in all directions. He doesn't try to make it comprehensive. And you know, German philosophers are famous for being comprehensive, exploring every single possible iteration of what they might say. And so that by the time it's done, you know, it's all in front of you. Swami's is seminal, which is, it's a catalyst for a whole host of other possibilities. So success means transcendence. Transcendence is such a, well, transcendence is such a wonderful word in English. It's just a glorious word. To, to succeed is to transcend. And we tend, tend to think that to succeed is to grab and to have and to hold. And he immediately starts by saying that success is a movement of energy. It's not something that we can hold in our hand. It's the way our whole consciousness is oriented. So I don't have to explain what he means by that, but because he will. It means finding what we really want which is not outward things, but inner peace of mind, self-understanding, and above all, the joy of God. Okay, inner peace of mind. Let's start there. Um, I, am, I have a very intent mental process, and I, can, I wake up. I tend to wake up very fast. I tend to wake up multiple times during the night. And it's a very interesting process to see when you come up from subconscious, where does your mind go? And sometimes my mind goes into a very peaceful place and sometimes it wakes up in a state of anxiety. And it'll just, it'll grab a thought. And it will simply hold on to that thought. And sometimes it's what I call, I live a split shift, which is to say, I sleep for a while, I'm up for a while. My friends will say to me, it's so nice to hear from you, but I see that the timing on this email is 2.30 a.m. <laughs> what were you doing at 2.30 a.m.? What I was doing was, I didn't have inner peace. And when you don't have inner peace, I and mean, think about it for yourself, it doesn't matter how lovely the home that you're wide awake in, in the middle of the night, walking around, worrying about what? Now, I have many tools for combating those uh, tensions when they arrive, but they still arrive. And as soon as they arrive, you realize everything else, it, everything else is spoiled, just totally spoiled, because there you are preoccupied. Have you ever been 
at a happy occasion, at a lovely place, but something was worrying you, you have no sense of what's going on around you and no capacity to enjoy it. Without inner peace, everything is lost. Everything. Sometimes I've asked people, what brought you to Ananda? What caused you to take up meditation? And many times the answer is, I was so stressed. I was just so stressed. I had to find a way to calm down my mind. So what is success without inner peace? So Swami starts, what do we really want? Inner peace. The second one he offers us is self-understanding. Isn't that? I mean, it's just interesting. Inner peace, self-understanding. And the, the self-understanding, I, I've had the experience in my life now in the past, but there was a period of time when I was doing a lot of couples counseling and just helping people through all of the chaos that that can represent. And I, I remember there was a very vivid example of this couple, and they, they had a very short marriage. And this, this was why, as far as I could see. All of us find ourselves unhappy from time to time. And oftentimes that unhappiness is, is there's, there's a sequence, there's a sequence of events. Something happens, I feel hurt, I feel angry, I feel jealous, something is catalyzed in me, something happens, I feel pain. Now, in close relationships, and thinking of this short-lived marriage, which was at least 30 years ago, so people are long since, the, the, the identities are irrelevant. The both parties to that relationship had no idea where their pain really came from. You know, meaning they didn't understand themselves. They didn't know that they were still very angry about childhood events or still living in an incarnation that was long past you know, when certain things happened and set their minds in certain ways. So there would be a, a, a sequence of events. He would say something. She would feel pain. She would say something back. He would feel pain. Now, because, as Master put it, Master had this marvelous phrase somewhere, because events follow each other in time, one thing follows another, we have the false impression that one thing causes another. I mean, that's a, I've thought about that one a great deal. I'm fine. You say something, I'm in pain. Your words caused my pain. Now, if you really want to get metaphysical about it, what was the karma that brought me to the situation where I was standing right in front of you and you spoke to me? Do you actually have anything to do with that karma? Or is this karma that's just been building up for a long time? Because karma is an unlearned lesson. And all lessons are the same. All lessons are generic. All lessons are something that has enough power over us that it can cause us to forget that our true nature is joy. And so we get to have life experiences. And all of those life experiences show us, you know, how, how vulnerable we are to forgetting that our true nature is joy. And so we have to face into something that seems bigger than our ability to hold on to that. And then we have to work our way through it until we can develop the independent inner strength that nothing can be stronger than our, our recollection, our smriti, our divine memory, that, it, that joy is my true nature. So self-understanding is the gradual coming to see what the karma really is. And the karma is not that you're awful. The karma is that I am vulnerable to your awfulness. You may, in fact, be awful. It's not like everybody's nice. Sometimes we are in association with people who do very unfortunate things for their own karma. 
But the suffering that we experience as a result of that is because we are susceptible to suffering. And that suffering is a karma that we created completely all on our own for a really long time. So in this particular archetypal situation, this couple, neither of them had any self-understanding. They, they just didn't know what inner attitudes, what unresolved karmas, what unresolved lessons caused them to suffer. So the poor dears, and they were both lovely people. There was nothing wrong in all the hours I've spent in this kind of counseling with people. Only occasionally, and sometimes it is true, the problem is actually that they're mismatched. Most of the time the problem is just inside the person. I remember this woman once came to Swamiji and she was in a very unfortunate relationship. It just was not harmonious in any way. But she had a kind of superstitious fear that there was this like destined one, a partner for her, and that if she, you know, she, she was going to miss the boat. The boat would come in, she wouldn't recognize it, she would not get on it, and then everything would be doomed after that. It was more superstition than anything else, but that's how she felt. So she was in this impossible situation because neither of them had the least capacity in the same way. And so she came to Swami and she sort of wanted to know, you know, whether this was the one. Swami tried to help her in practical ways, just everything that he could do to, you know, try to guide her in the right way. She was receptive only to a certain extent, so there was only so much he could say. I happened to be in the room for reasons that I don't know. He often had me in the room when he was talking to people. Not often, but more often than you would think. He was instructing me. After the woman left, he said, <clears throat> He said, you have to be very, very advanced. <clears throat> you have to be very, very advanced spiritually for your karma to be so exact that there's only one path for you, one person, one path. He said, and in her case, he said, quote, she has so many lessons to learn, she could learn them with any number of people. It's like it hasn't gotten down to just this tiny little you know, remnant of karma that's left that, that, that brings you into such a forceful destiny. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not encouraging that you just sort of find somebody on the corner and try to make them a life partner. <laughs> For some reason, I'm taking this whole thing into marriage, but I'll finish it. <coughs> <coughs> because marriage is a particular kind of friendship that is particularly demanding and it exposes our lack of self-understanding. So that's, that's why I'm emphasizing it here. Now let me see where I was. Just give me a moment because I lost the train. Um, hmm. But I will find it. Nope. I've lost it now. Too bad. Any of you in the room? Can you remind me where I was? But I can't, so I'll have to go on from that. Self-understanding. <clears throat> Learning where we were. <clears throat> All right. Oh, I was just saying marriage is a particular kind of friendship that really helps us to understand. It's not, it's not something outside the field of ordinary life like some people think it is. It isn't at all. It's just a more, it's an intensification of our capacity to know ourselves sufficiently to understand cause and effect properly. And if we, if we lack self-understanding, it becomes pretty much it becomes very hard to learn, and it becomes very hard for other people to help us. The most distressing situations I ever find myself in, distressing because of the, the inevitable pain that's going to have to come, is when a person presents to me their self-concept and they're missing something really fundamental. 
And then it just, it just gets very hard to chart a right course. We're just always confused. So when, we're, when we lack self-understanding, and this is, again, either to acquire outward success or to actually have success that is also inwardly powerful. If we don't have self-understanding, we're constantly confused by the feedback we get from the world. And by no means are other people always right. They're more likely to be wrong <laughs> than not. I mean, because if they don't have self-understanding, they're going to be projecting upon you. This is the way the whole thing runs. But if we're fortunate enough to have helpful people in our lives, if we don't have self-understanding, we won't know that. And we'll set ourselves to do goal, to do things that we, don't, we really can't achieve. I helped this woman once through this whole process, and she was setting up this independent business. She really wanted to have uh, independent income. She went to a training courses. She learned to do this. It was some obscure sort of service having to do with, I don't even remember, but utility bills or something like that. But it was some kind of a way of helping people uh, navigate some bureaucratic thing. It was a, you know, it was a valid service, and it was worth doing. However, the entire business actually was based on on the phone. You had to, you had to do a great deal on the phone. It may have involved a lot of sales calls, but there was a lot of phone work. After working on this for like three or four months, finally getting it set up, she, ex she admitted that she never liked to talk on the phone and she was rather phobic about talking on the phone. It was like, I didn't even know where to begin. I just was cheerful and supportive at that point. But it's like, and now this one she even like sort of half knew but we can't have success of any kind unless we know what the instrument is. You can't set out to be an opera singer if you're tone deaf. You know, you can't set out to be an athlete if you, if you don't like to get sweaty. I mean, you just, you have to know who you are and what you're working with. And when you do, then you can figure out your talents, you can figure out your strengths, you can tell what's going on around you. And, and so happiness, in other words, happiness comes from self-understanding. So, it means finding what we really want, which is not outward things, but inner peace of mind, self-understanding. You know, if you're trying to raise children and you don't have self-understanding, you're always projecting upon your children things that have nothing to do with them. And you know, kids are marvelous at calling you out on that. It's a, kids are a great teacher of self-understanding, or being a school teacher is also really, really good. I, I work um, for about six weeks a year in our elementary school. I work, I help with the costumes, and I get really involved with all the children, 60, 80, depending on how many kids we have that year. And, uh, but it's a, it's a I, and I'm very well schooled in, of course, the teachings of self-realization and how to work with people, and I'm moderately schooled in the Education for Life principles upon which our school is based, not as well educated by any means. And believe me, my lack of education shows up. Most of the children are very good, but they're, they're strong-minded and they're willful. They should be willful. We're, we're trying to develop their willpower. They should have willpower. But sometimes, you know, they're just rebellious as children are, or uncooperative, or I'm having an off day and they know more than I do, and they're not going to take any gut from me, whatever it might be. But sometimes I find myself just trying to overpower them. It's just like, I'm bigger, I'm older, I'm in charge, I have a lot of things to do. and it, I, I just lose all connection with all of the high principles that I know, and I just want to dominate them with willpower. It usually doesn't work, and usually I notice before. That doesn't mean I never use authority, because authority is sometimes the appropriate thing to use. But it's, it's the self-understanding that that experience brings. We have this idea that, you know, I'll just give birth to babies and then all of a sudden I'll be a good parent. But uh, not at all. What is success? Based on self-understanding. And then he says in this first paragraph, and it's obvious I'm not going to finish today, and above all, the joy of God. So what is it that we're always seeking? We're always seeking happiness, aren't we? And to alleviate suffering. And the devotee gradually learns that there is this 
bottomless wellspring of perfect bliss which lives inside me. And that is related to my capacity to feel God's presence. So, because when we feel God's presence, all of a sudden the joy of that, the love of that, that's why the definition of God is bliss. We're trying to find an English word. The actual word is ananda, which means the bliss of the divine, not merely the happiness of having a new dress or something like that. The joy Swami uses here. The joy of God is the experience of happiness inside that simply can't be touched by anything. Now, when we bring the idea of success all the way down to the bottom, I've spent time here on self-understanding and peace of mind, but even self-understanding and peace of mind, why do we want them? Because it will give us happiness. But happiness is not a clear enough word. It will give us joy. It will give us bliss. And when that bliss is rooted in transcendence, see, true success is transcendence. The joy of God is a tr- transcendent joy. And what that word means in this context is that it, it transcends all limiting conditions. And sometimes you hear extraordinary stories about people in extreme circumstances who discover this inward reality of joy, which, which God is the only, the best and the easiest word for it, whatever word you use, this inward reality of joy that simply transcends all other conditions. And that's, well, that's what success is, because then, no matter what comes to us, we can always go back to that. Master called it a portable paradise that we carry within us. I, whenever I say that phrase, I think back to what it would have been 1967 in my life. And a particular place where I was living at the time, when that phrase came into my life, a portable paradise. You know, Master was exceedingly clever with the words he used. And when, when words are well thought out and well crafted, they have a, a resonance because they have a vibration. Just that idea, first you start with paradise. Paradise just is everything that, that you want to have, isn't it? You know, I always think of Hawaii when I think of paradise because tropical islands to me are what's normal. Everything else is an aberration from what the way things should be. So I think of my experiences on vacation in Hawaii and the way the air smelled. And, and then you think of peace of mind. You think of self-understanding, meaning I know who I am. I am comfortable in my own skin. I accept myself the way I am. I'm not at war, at constantly at war with the person that I am. I understand it. And so you have this happiness that, that comes over you. And then I, I give it a, an external picture, which is why I think of it as Hawaii, the portable paradise. But what that is, that's the joy of God. See, this is so, the whole self-realization teaching, when you really get into it, is so remarkable. Master said, the only place where God can be experienced is in the human nervous system. And that is, that's also one of my wonderfully favorite combinations of words. The human nervous system. That's what, I, that's what I carry around with me all the time. Oh, there's the portable paradise. I'm carrying around within me the only place where God can be experienced. Because he's, he's not outside of us more deeply. He is us. And his nature is bliss. So I have within me this portable paradise. And karma is anything that can persuade me that I need to abandon that paradise for the hell of lack of peace of mind, lack of self-knowledge, loneliness, anger, jealousy, the whole long thing. And there's lots of karma. That's what the karma is. You, you go through it. Karma takes you out of your portable paradise, but you're always carrying it. And you can all, it's always an option to just open that door and go back into it. And it doesn't separate you from this world. It just allows you to transcend the limitations of this world. 
So all of this in the first paragraph of the first quality of our roadmap for right living. So God bless you, my friends.